Hi, friends. Um, welcome to uh, this series and to the first session. I'm sitting here in St. John's Cathedral in Denver, in Colorado, with a group of friends. And uh, you've had an opportunity in the study materials to already read the first essay written by Phyllis Tickle. In a moment, we're going to hear Phyllis elaborate, uh, offer example, and fill out some of the uh, comments that she made in that essay. And then, after 10 minutes with Phyllis, we're going to move into a group conversation in which people will have an opportunity to uh, speak with Phyllis and to explore further the issues that she is raising in this first session. So right now, I just want to let you know who's here in the circle with me and uh, the names of the uh, this small group, which might be similar to the size of a group that you have in your congregation, may, may, be, may be smaller. Small groups are typically 8 to 12 uh, folks. Well, we have six of us in the circle today. And here is Kim, China, and Phyllis. Mm -hmm. My name is Tim, and this is James and Caroline. And as I said, we're sitting here in the library of St. John's Cathedral in Denver. So enough introduction. That's where we are. That's who we are. And uh, you'll find out more about us as the conversation proceeds over these six sessions. But right now, I'm going to ask Phyllis to offer her first 10-minute uh, exploration on this first topic. Phyllis. Mark, Bishop Mark Dwyer, um, who is at Virginia Theological Seminary, um, is famous and, and much loved for a number of things, but none perhaps more pertinent to what we're talking about than his oft-repeated uh, oft comment that to understand what's happening in the church, you have to understand that about every 500 years we feel compelled to have a giant rummage sale, and we're having one. Uh, and he's absolutely right. The, uh, the rummage sale is the 300-pound uh, gorilla in the living room. Now, whether you call it a rummage sale or you give it a more, and obviously he's jesting, or give it a more um, elaborate or academic name, the truth still is that about every 500 years, that part of the world that is Latinized, uh, that is, that received its Christianity through the Latin language, or that received it uh, from those who had received it from the Latin language, or who had been colonized by those who had received it from those who had received it, however you extend it. Latinized Christian, the area in which Latinized Christianity holds influence, for some reason, every 500 years goes through a huge upheaval. Um, and that upheaval is across every part of life. It's not just the church itself. It's everything in the culture that goes whoopee and then comes back down, that goes through a, a rummage sale. Um, which is to say that if you go back 500 years from where we are right now, you hit the Great Reformation. Uh, and if you go back 500 years from that, you hit the Great Schism in 1054. 500 years before that, you hit the Great Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And if you go back 500 years before that, you hit, whoops, uh, the Great Transformation, uh, the change of the era. So we do this thing. Now, why we do it, uh, nobody really seems to know. It just is consistent. If we had a good rabbi here amongst us today, uh, we would also know that it's a Judeo-Christian phenomenon. That is to say, if you go back 500 years from the Great Transformation, you hit the Babylonian captivity and the end of First Temple Judaism, the coming of Second. And 500 years before that, you hit the end of the Age of Judges and the coming of the Davidic dynasty, out of which Meshua was to come. So for some reason, whether it's inherent in our culture, inherent in our language, inherent in our faith, who knows, we do this thing. Uh, and Mark Dyer uh, is, is absolutely right. We are doing it again. Um, and when we become unsettled about what's happening to the institutional church, when we come, become unsettled about what's happening to some of our uh, young people and some of our older folk uh, also, um, we, we are consoled, I think, uh, if we take the long lens of history. And that's what I hope we do here uh, in our time together, is look at the long lens of history. Yes, there's some frightening things that happened. You better believe there are. Because each time we go through one of these things, 
everything changes. The one we're going through right now is called the Great Emergence, but the one we are most familiar with historically is the Great Reformation, because we were taught that in high school and, and in college. And if you remember, the Great Reformation was taught to you in terms of it was the rise of the nation state, it was the coming of the middle class, it was the birth of capitalism, and oh, by the way, it gave us Protestantism, which is pretty much how secular schools teach uh, what was happening for very good reason. Everything changed, and uh, whatever form of religion holds hegemony when we go through one of these things uh, has to drop back and reconfigure. I think it's terribly important that as we look at what we're going through right now, we understand that whatever held hegemony, whatever form of religion uh, uh, of the faith um, uh, was important, had, had power uh, of place, pride of place, uh, never ceases to be. It does not cease to be. The institutional church is not going to cease to be. Protestantism isn't going to cease to be. Anglicanism isn't going to cease to be. Roman Catholicism isn't going to cease to be. Uh, Orthodoxy isn't going to cease to be. We're all going to have to reconfigure to make room for this thing, which is called emergence Christianity. And I need to sidebar here to make what I think is a very Im important point. We're talking about emergence Christianity. In the same way that 500 years ago we talked about Protestantism, but we never for one minute thought that all Baptists and all Lutherans and all Presbyterians w were alike. Uh, nor did we think that all Protestants had to be Baptists to be called Protestants. That's not true, unless you're a Baptist. They're very fond of it, but nonetheless. nonetheless. Um, so that in the same way, emergence Christianity is what's happening. And it's the, it's the unfortunate thing is that sociologically, economically, intellectually, politically, what we're going through is the great emergence. And it's really unfortunate that the form of religion is being called by the same name, emergence Christianity. Uh, at least the Reformation had the decency to say everything is changing, and by the way, here's Protestantism. But the point is, this is emergence Christianity. Uh, and it has now at least eight or ten clearly definable, distinct presentations or divisions within itself. Emerging church is not the same as emergent church, nor is emergent church the same as neo-monastic, nor is it the same as alt-worship, nor is it the same as uh, fresh expressions, nor is it the same as hyphenated, nor is it the same as, as cyber church. Those are all presentations of the overarching sensibility. So what we're really talking about here, I hope, is the overarching sensibility, the characteristics that will be applied in different ways in the various divisions, but will still inform them. And is it a new form of Christianity? You bet your sweet life it is. Uh, in the same way that Protestantism was a new form of Christianity. In the same way that Roman Catholicism uh, was a new form when it came and separated out from Latin Christianity. So we're in the process of birth something and we need to remember first of all that no never 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 as whatever held hegemony as it had to drop back ever ceased to be the second thing is the faith has always spread geographically and demographically after every one of these upheavals and the third thing is that there's a central question every single time that is the same question um, every 500 years we ask it all uh, all over again and that question is, where now is our authority? What gets lost in the shuffle is who makes the rules. Now, emergence Christians, by definition, and, and some of you are, so you know, uh, are, are really uh, unhappy about hierarchical things like rules. You know, so they don't like to have me say, uh, who makes the rules? They would prefer to say, um, uh, you know, who's calling the shots or where are the parameters or something. But ultimately, when you get right down to it, the question is, where now is our authority? Uh, and when Luther came along uh, 500 years ago in the last brouhaha, the last rummage sale, the last tsunami, when he came along, um, he, for very good reasons, had to get rid of the established uh, authority, which was the curia, the papacy, uh, and the magisterium. Um, and uh, those things weren't valid anymore. And so he cast about and asked, who, where now are the rules? Uh, who, where now is the authority? Uh, and he had no problem with authority. He's a good Lutheran, um, or vice versa. Good Lutherans came from him. Anyway, uh, authority is not, does it break the mountain an itch, spiritually or intellectually? So he could say, where now is the authority? And he answered the question very clearly. Sola scriptura, scriptura sola. Um, and having arrived at that, uh, he put in place both the wonder and the disaster of the last 500 years. 
and the thing that we are now busily disestablishing because it wouldn't play. Now, when we uh, get another chance to speak, I would like to uh, begin with that uh, authority business and with uh, how Luther set it up. And look, because internal uh, to the 500-year cycles, again, for some reason, and who knows why, there is a cycle within the cycle. There always is. Systems theorists, people have all kinds of, of notions about why this happens. And, but there is cycling within every given cycle in biology, including this one. Uh, and the cycle is that we hit that moment of crisis. Uh, we hit uh, October 31st, 1517, when purportedly Luther taxed the 95 on the door. Sad truth is he doesn't tack them on the door. It makes a great story like Washington and the cherry tree. You know, it doesn't happen. But he does write the 95, you know, so they're there. And, and they, are, they are circulated on October 31st, 1517. When, when he does that, uh, he has laid us off on a pattern. And it will be about 100 years from 1517, and you can look at history and see it, before the answer will really come to where now is the authority question. It takes about 100 years for us all to agree where we're going to say, okay, the, even though he postulates immediately, sola scriptura, it takes a while to apply it and to let it diffuse out into the culture. Then there's a period of about 250 years, once the authority has been established, of about 250 years, uh, in which we all agree that's where the authority is. We don't like it, some of us. Some of us are purely against it, as a matter of fact, but we all agree that's where the authority is. That's who's calling the shots. And then there's a period, uh, the most interesting one, of about 150 years in which, having said that's the authority, we not only don't like it, we don't believe it anymore, and we begin to chip away at it. And that 150 years is called the Perry, um, the Perry Reformation, uh, the Perry Schism, the Perry Emergence in, in our case, or the, the Grand Tick Up, which I greatly prefer because it's a lot less formal, but it's the Great Tick Up. Um, and, and I want to spend some time also looking at the tick up uh, that led us. The Great Emergence is uh, commonly dated now from 9-11, which as an observer I had some trouble with originally. It seemed to me it was a fairly parochial dating for something so significant because we need to be very clear that Emergence Christianity is all over the Latinized culture. It's not, it came to the United States last interestingly enough, or it came to the North American continent last. Uh, Canada is, I think in all fairness, right tracking along pretty much with us. Um, but uh, in Africa, it's known as Amahoro. In South America, it's Lora del Camino. In Malaysia, it's Lora de Malaysia, which I love to say because I can't really say it, but I can't <laughs> spell it at all. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, but uh, and 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 uh, in in some parts of Spain, uh, it, it's called by a more logical name, Generación Emergente. Um, but it's all over that uh, Latinized part of the world. So we we don't in any way own it in, in this country. And 9/11 therefore seemed to me a kind of parochial um, sort of, of dating. But apparently, the scholars say it was so global in its effect, uh, it changed everything for the Latinized world in many ways. Uh, and so it's probably going to be dated from that. Uh, and the Perry emergence, right on time, or the tick up, uh, can be dated from 1842, which means that the 150 years holes were, you know, uh, scarily on point. Mm -hmm.